Karl Dönitz was born on September 16, 1891, in Grunau, near Berlin. At age 18, he enlisted as a cadet in what was then the Kaiserliche Marine, or Imperial Navy. He was taken prisoner by the British in 1918, when in command of a U-boat, a mere month before the end of the First World War. Once back in Germany, he was made commander of one of the German Navy's school ships, named Emden. Just three years later, in 1936, Donitz was named as commander-in-chief of the legendary U-boat division by Adolf Hitler himself. His official title would be Befehlshaber der Unterseebote, or BDU. He had immense pride in being the head of the submarine division, a role for which he was perfectly suited. Admiral Karl Donitz played a pivotal, even deadly role in the war waged in the Atlantic Ocean. In the end, more than 100,000 merchant and navy sailors from Britain alone lost their lives in the so-called Battle of the Atlantic. Strategy was a passion for Karl Donitz. This fascination with how to outsmart the enemy began during his stint as a POW in a British prison. It was during this time that he formulated a strategic theory which would later become known as the Rudel Tactic or Pack Tactic. It would be better known as the Wolf Pack Strategy. The strategy was essentially about penetrating and defeating convoys. The convoy system had been introduced by the British during World War I, whereby non-combatant merchant vessels traveled in convoys protected by anti-submarine ships. As its name suggests, the Wolfpack strategy meant that a group or pack of U-boats would attack a convoy from different angles, rather than attack by just one U-boat, much as wolves hunt their prey. This attack by multiple U-boats would overwhelm the naval vessels in the convoy. Chaos and confusion would reign as protector ships would be attacked from different angles by different U-boats, each utilizing their own strategy on the fly. All of this made the sinking of all important merchant vessels far easier. The effect was devastating on Allied ships. The strategy was so effective that it would later be imitated by the Americans with their submarines. To be fair, this form of multiple sub-attack had already been advocated by forgotten Kapitän Hermann Bauer, who was the head of the U-boat division during the First World War. However, Bauer never found success with the Wolfpack strategy during that war. Donitz took it to a whole new level during World War II. This battle strategy went hand in hand with Donitz's greater scheme of what he dubbed total war in the Atlantic. To him, it was simple mathematics. The tonnage of Allied ships sunk each month had to be more than the tonnage of new ships being built. This philosophy worked very well for the Germans until May 1943, when the Allies finally started getting the upper hand on both land and sea. Donitz wasn't always spot on with his strategies. One notorious failure was Operation Tana Ost in mid-1944, which tried to capture the Finnish island of Sursari by blockading the Gulf of Finland. It was executed to try and prevent the Soviets from capturing the strategically important island. Hitler was highly enthusiastic about Dönitz's proposal. However, it was a crazy plan that could never succeed, especially that late in the war when Germany was already losing. It resulted in scores of German soldiers being captured by the Finns and a humiliating loss for Germany. Many people don't know that there were in fact two supreme leaders during the Third Reich, the second of which was none other than Karl Dönitz. This was on the orders of Hitler himself, who by then was hidden in his bunker in the center of Berlin. On April 29, 1945, Hitler declared in his last will and testament that Dönitz be his successor as Staatsoberhaupt, or head of state, as well as Reichspräsident, or president of the Reich, and supreme commander of the armed forces. He would be the head of what was termed the Flensburg government, Technically, Hitler never named Donitz as actual Fuhrer. His humongous ego probably couldn't go that far. It didn't matter since by May 1st, both Hitler and his other favorite Josef Goebbels had committed suicide. That made Donitz the de facto and sole representative of the Third Reich. He would order the surrender of Germany on May 7, 1945, which formally ended the war in Europe. Dönitz remained president of Germany and supreme commander of the armed forces until the Allied powers dissolved his cabinet on May 23, 1945. Peter Dönitz, younger son of Karl Dönitz, was born in Poland on March 20, 1922. Our initial intent with this video was to focus as much as possible on Peter Dönitz. Unfortunately, very little has been written about him and so we can only focus on how he died. 
That happened on May 19, 1943, in the North Atlantic, southeast of Cape Farewell in Greenland. Donitz Jr. was first watch officer on U-954 when it was sunk by a series of depth charges dropped by a British frigate, HMS Jed, in cohort with the British sloop, HMS Senin. U-954, like so many other U-boats, had an unremarkable and short-lived existence. It was launched on October 28, 1942, at a time when Germany still held the upper hand in the Atlantic. It would be used as a training sub during the early part of 1943, and only ever had one active patrol. It operated with five different wolf packs between April 25th and May 19, 1943 before its sinking off Greenland. The name of Peter Donitz is inscribed in the Multenort U-Boat Memorial in Heikendorf in Kreisplön, northern Germany. Ironically, that was the exact part of Schleswig-Holstein in which his father had acted as president of Germany in the final days of the Second World War. Worth noting as well is what happened to the other Donitz son, the older one named Klaus. In what could be considered astounding elitism, it was a rule in Nazi Germany that the other sons of high-ranking officers could be exempt from military service if one son had already died in action, and so Klaus Donitz was allowed to withdraw from combat. Klaus commenced his education as a naval doctor at the University of Tübingen, still keeping in touch with his friends in service. On his 24th birthday on May 13, 1944, Klaus convinced his friends to attack the port of Selsey on England's south coast in what could only be described as a frankly stupid and reckless adventure. They made for the English coast on a fast boat S-141, but it was destroyed before reaching shore. Six Germans were rescued from the debris, but Klaus Donitz was not among the survivors. His body would eventually wash up on a beach in France, on the other side of the English Channel. Do we have an idea of how Karl Donitz reacted to the death of his two sons, one on a U-boat, the other on a fast boat? No, we don't. He never spoke openly about how he felt about losing his two sons. We can only surmise that he grieved like any other of the countless parents who lost sons to that war. Or maybe he didn't, perhaps justifying it as their so-called glorious contribution to the Nazi cause. Who knows? By his own words and proud admission, Karl Donitz was a dedicated Nazi, having been awarded the Golden Party Badge for his loyalty to the Nazi Party in 1944. He was a fanatical supporter of Adolf Hitler. Donitz has been described by historians as a picture book Nazi, with his dedication to Nazism noted by several naval officers. His loyalty to Hitler was absolute. For example, he refused to help Albert Speer in the latter's efforts to stop Hitler's scorched earth policy, because Donitz believed in everything Hitler did. He once declared, in comparison to Hitler, we are all pipsqueaks. Anyone who believes he can do better than the Fuhrer is stupid. His belief in Nazism was so strong that he did much to spread fervent Nazi ideology within the Kriegsmarine. It's notable that no naval officer was ever implicated in any of the various plots to assassinate Hitler. Donitz was indicted on multiple charges at the Nuremberg trials, but was ultimately only found guilty of committing crimes against peace and war crimes against the laws of war. He served 10 years in prison. He never once recanted his beliefs in Nazism until the day he died of a heart attack on Christmas Eve in 1980 in the small town of Aumule near Hamburg. In the end, Donitz's beloved U-boat division didn't win the war for his Fuhrer. A total of 648 U-boats were lost during World War II, of which 429, or just over 68%, had no survivors. And of these hundreds of U-boats that were lost, more than a third, or 215 to be exact, were lost during their very first patrol. Perhaps the most shocking statistic of all is that approximately 30,000 of the 40,000 men who served on board U-boats lost their lives. That means that about 75% of U-boat crew never survived the war. Is that a statistic that a proud, arrogant man like Karl Donitz could be proud of? We can only conclude that he probably didn't care, or justified it somehow. So absolute was he in his devotion to the Nazi cause, and the Fuhrer he admired so much. Nevertheless, we need to remember that Karl Donitz was in many ways an outstanding strategic thinker. He often boasted that he had advised Hitler to deploy 300 U-boats instead of only 30 at the commencement of World War II in 1939. 
He was convinced the war would have been won had Hitler listened to him. According to many historians, there is grim truth to Donitz's claim. They believe that Nazi Germany may very well have won the war early on had Hitler done what Dönitz had advised. Allied shipping was extremely vulnerable to U-boat attacks in the early part of the war. Merchant ships carrying food, fuel, munitions, and other supplies were of supreme importance to the Allied war effort. Without those merchant ships, countries simply couldn't fight or even defend themselves. By early 1943, the mortality rate among Allied merchant marine crews of torpedoed ships was a shockingly high 50%. That was how bad it was for the Allies in the Atlantic. Therefore, it's not a stretch to surmise that 10 times more submarines from the start could very well have destroyed the Allies. One can only be grateful that Hitler chose not to listen to Donitz, choosing instead to focus on what the Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe, or Army and Air Force, could achieve. In retrospect, Karl Dönitz and his beloved U-boats could have indeed had a far greater impact on the outcome of the Second World War. Thankfully, we will never know.